Hello and welcome to the Everyone Has a Story podcast. Growing up at a very young age, I was probably no different than any other small child. I wanted to always be connected with my friends and new people, but I also loved art. You know, obviously I'm not going to be very good at it or I wasn't very good at it as through my story will tell. I got sent to a summer camp when I was about six or seven years old. I think it was about a week long. And I really didn't connect with anybody my age, but I connected with a couple of the older guys. And I really wanted to just hang around these guys because I felt much older and and, uh, not like a child anymore. And during the summer camp, the, the instructor gave us some crafts to do, some art crafts, and we had to do some drawing. And these two guys just absolutely jumped in both feet first and they were just drawing away. And and so time ran short. So before we got to present what we drew, we 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 went to another, you know, little segment of the summer camp. But I got to take my drawing home and I got to update it, you know, work on it a little bit. And before I left camp that day. I got a chance to see what the other guys drew and they, they, I mean, in my eyes, they were really, really good drawings. So I went home and because I wanted to be considered equal to these guys, I stayed up all night. I mean, I was drawing away because I was going to have a really, really good presentation to these guys and to the camp counselor the next day. So I show up, I'm excited. I'm with my two new friends and we get to the arts and craft part of the camp and I we're now showing our our products, our, our final products there. And sure enough, one of the guys looked over at me and the first words out of his mouth was, yuck, that's terrible. <laughs> All of a sudden, my big inflated balloon just started losing air very, very quickly. And when the camp counselor came around, they looked at my drawing and they said, yeah, this is nice, Roger, you know, but they were given accolades to all the other people but me. They were given that bob head like, yeah, this is this is nice, Roger. But all I kept hearing was my my new friend saying, yuck, this is terrible. And what's really sad is that for the rest of the week, these guys really didn't have a whole lot to do with me anymore. And so all of a sudden, I lost that connection. And when I met my guest speaker today, I I knew that that this person is the answer to I think a lot of issues that we have in life and in the workplace where a lot of times we we have no problem saying our words, verbalizing our words to either our team at work or to our neighbors or friends, family, or whatever, but but they lose some energy. They lose some zest. And sometimes, you know, you look over and you see that the audience is almost half asleep because all you're doing is just saying a bunch of words. And I know that there are some people out there that can say and tell a great story that keep people entertained. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, can we do better than just a good entertaining story? Like I'm sure you all think about with my summer camp uh, excursion. But the fact of the matter is, why not put some of these words to life? And with my guest speaker today, we're going to talk about adding some life and some energy to our words. So with nothing else being said, let me introduce you to Noriko Matsubara. How are you? Hello, Roger. Thank you for having me here today. Thank thank you for being here. I'm very uh, excited to have you here. Noriko is an artist, she's a children's author and illustrator, and she's a workshop facilitator and connector. This is important because she knows how to connect with other people through not just words, but also through her drawings and images. So Noriko, why don't you do a little bit deeper dive of your introduction to yourself? Okay, so um, I'm an artist and children's book author and illustrator. I'm also a YouTuber creating Japanese language lesson content where I incorporate my picture book characters. When I'm not in my studio, I visit schools and other public venues to deliver Japanese art workshops 
um, talks and presentations about Japan and Japanese culture. Um, as you may have guessed, I'm originally from Japan and was born and raised there. After I finished university, I moved about and went to Ireland, Lebanon, Canada, and finally settled in the UK 16 years ago, where I live with my husband and two children now. Well, I, I know from the our very first introduction and conversation, you know, all you kept representing to me was what you do and how you do it. It really adds life and energy to words. <clears throat> and obviously being a, a children's author and illustrator and uh, a teacher of the Japanese language, you know, you, you have to be number one creative, but you have to also have enough entertainment and energy to keep everybody's attention focused on what you're delivering. And so that's really what the whole focus of today's conversation is about. So from the very first conversation we had, you always talked about bringing words to life. So really, what does that mean to you when you say bringing words to life? <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right. So speaking and writing are form forms of communication. But I've always find it hard to convey everything I wanted to express through just words. So either in English or Japanese, I always had a problem. Um, that's why I became an artist, because drawing pictures is the best way for me to express myself. So for me, drawing pictures brings words to life. Pictures allow me to convey not only my thoughts, but emotions. I believe that pictures have a unique power to evoke emotions in viewers and create a connection that words alone may not achieve. So let me share my experience of bringing words to life. When I was doing my master's degree in fine art, my artwork always focused on the issues surrounding nuclear power. I'm from the area where Japan's major nuclear project has been taking place. They were building a nuclear waste reprocessing plant and the landscapes were rapidly changing. I felt so compelled to face the nuclear issues through my art. So I created a huge blackboard drawing of the world map expressing the world's connection with the nuclear industry, its problems and impact on the world at the various levels. Within this drawing, I incorporated many illustrations, each representing a specific story. For example, on the US map, I drew a portrait of John Wayne. His portrait represents the story of Hollywood actors who filmed Westerns in Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, and reportedly experienced high rates of cancers. In another example, on the Bikini Atoll, I drew a mushroom cloud, symbolizing the first public test of a nuclear bomb. Next to the mushroom cloud, I drew a bikini swimsuit, which was actually named after the Bikini Atoll reflecting the image of the atom split into half. Though the picture of bikini may look a bit comical, my intention was to illustrate how our daily lives were intertwined with the legacy of nuclear bomb testing. Also, I wanted to raise awareness about the lasting impact of nuclear bomb testing on the people in the bikini atoll area. And of course, every story represented in my blackboard drawing could be conveyed through words, but it would be many pages long and it's kind of disturbing content. So not everyone would want to read it. Also, I believe that words alone wouldn't be able to convey the same depth of emotions as pictures can. Pictures can deliver empathic emotion. That's why 
I created a blackboard drawing to make sure that nuclear issues are more relatable to the viewers. But I must ab admit that not everyone who saw my blackboard piece could get the message I wanted to convey without further explanation. A quick glance at John Wayne's portrait wouldn't necessarily reveal the deeper meaning behind it, right? So um, after I made this blackboard piece, I decided to create a digital gallery of my blackboard drawing, combining both writing and drawing. As I said, I believe pictures have a special power to bring words to life. By combining writing and illustrations, I can get my messages across with the whole emotions to go with, and that leads to a better communication. So this practice of combining writing and illustra illustrations ultimately led me on the path to becoming a children's book author and illustrator. So, so let's talk about that path. Obviously, you've chosen this career of being an author, a storyteller, and an illustrator. But I know that you're also kept up with what's going on in the world today. Mm -hmm. And so why do you believe putting words to life can make a difference in a lot of our communications? Mm -hmm. Well, effective communication serves as a bridge to connect with others. When we can communicate more clearly, we can minimize the potential for misunderstandings and we can connect deeper. So for me, the combination of writing illustrating works the best because illustration helped me express my emotions and writing helps me to be articulate. But there is a potential for misunderstandings when the writer and artists are not the same person. That's why I avoided illustrating stories written by other authors for a long time. I used to think, oh, what if my illustrations turn out to be uh, completely different from what the author envisioned and they just end up disliking my illustrations at all. So uh, it's that fear of rejection that held me back from taking on such projects. But my perspective changed when the um, opportunity to work with CBBS, which is the BBC's children TV channel, uh, that showed up. They approached me to illustrate a story for their new Storytime app. I was so thrilled to be chosen as uh, one of the illustrators for this project. But at the same time, I was so scared to illustrate someone else's story. But I didn't want to miss this opportunity, so I gathered up my courage and told the BBC producer, yes, I will do it. So, I, I you know, we, we, we've all heard how, you know, the two things that most people are afraid of is death and public speaking, you know, <laughs> and, and we all are in our professional lives and our just our personal lives, we are given opportunities or put in, you know, in opportunities to do talking. And sometimes, as we all know, we can bore people to death. Mm -hmm. And so how can these individuals, sometimes me, how can we take what your practice is of putting words to life through some illustrations, how can that, you know, be implemented today? Or how should it be implemented today? Mm -hmm. Well, public speaking uh, really makes me nervous too. <laughs> um, but um, when um, I got commissioned by uh, the BBC, uh, the story I was given was about the blind black girl. And uh, at this moment of panic, I was like, oh, no, I've never drawn a black or blind person before. It felt like uncharted territory for me. Um, so I asked myself, oh, can I really do it? Can I do it? But then I remember the phrase, everything 
is figure outable. Um, I think that's what um, Marie Folia says. So I told myself, you know what? I can do it. I'll do some research and have conversation with the author. So that's a start. So making myself understand was a start. So I did research on what it's like to be blind. I exchanged emails with the author and we even set up a Zoom meeting to discuss the story in detail. During our conversation, I was really curious about the meaning of the character's name, Olana, and turned out it means father's gold in the Nigerian tribe language, which was like a spark of inspiration for me because uh, it gave me the idea to illustrate the girl with a golden aura around her in her first appearance in the story. I also asked the author about what Olana's lunchbox might look like, since um, I wasn't familiar with the Nigerian food mentioned in the text. I also found out that the author didn't want to reveal the fact that Olana is blind until later in the story. That gave me the idea of illustrating Olana with her eyes closed. And to make it natural, I decided to have her smiling in most of the scenes, so her closed eyes wouldn't look unnatural. I also asked the author about the message she wanted to convey through this story. It was essential for me to understand the hurt of the story, and I'm so glad I had the opportunity to talk it through with her. So, for illustrations, I first drew a few sketches of the main character and asked the author for her feedback. Then I divided the text into scenes and created a storyboard, which is a thumbnail sketches of illustrations. I sent the storyboard to the BBC and the author and asked for their feedback. I always wanted to make sure if they're happy with them. So based on their input, I made a few adjustments. Once we established the framework for the whole story, I was finally ready to start color illustrations. So at the start of the project, I was very scared to illustrate someone else's story, but it actually turned out to be an invaluable experience. And it gave me a new perspective on working as an illustrator. The highlight of this experience was when the author told me she cried when she saw the illustrations. Um, she said, my illustration captures exactly what she had envisioned in her mind. I felt so touched because I felt like we were able to share the same vision and co-create the world together with writing and illustrations. So this whole experience of illustrating someone else's story has shaped my journey. I now aspire to collaborate with more authors and help them bring their visions to life through illustrations. So, you know, the one thing that I, I love about what you do and how you do it is that you ask a lot of questions and you stay very, very curious. And I'm sure that's what keeps you very creative. Mm -hmm. But now let's talk about other than authors, who else could use your advice? You know, I've met a lot of people who have a message to say, but they're never really been trained or took the time to get the training to, to deliver a good message. So mm -hmm. really, who could use this advice by putting some additional images or illustrations to their words? Well, I would say not just for children's book authors, but also authors who write books for adults. Unlike children's books, books for adults typically lack illustrations. Um, people may think adults don't need illustrations. Um, since they can imagine the written words by themselves. But I think incorporating illustrations 
into adult books can enhance their appeal and engagement. By capturing the essence of the text, um, accompanying illustrations can evo evoke emotions and feelings um, intended by the author. Um, and also, illustrations can help their reader stay focused. I don't know about you, but I often find my mind wandering while reading. So I sometimes have to go back and reread the text. Do you do that? Yes, absolutely. Um, we all do, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. It's not only me. So uh, including occasional illustrations can help slow down the reader's mind and bring them back to the present moment. Yeah, I wish I had uh, books um, for adults with lots of illustrations. I think collaboration between authors and illustrators has a huge potential. This collaboration can enhance the reading experience and make the world more entertaining place. And that's for readers of all ages. Well, if there's any one community out there that needs some more fun energy and some entertainment mm -hmm. is the business community. And so what advice and really, does this even apply to a business or an organization? Yeah, absolutely. This approach is relevant for businesses and organizations um, who are looking to improve their communication and also engagement. Um, whether you are a presenter, trainer, keynote speaker, or business owner, looking for better engagement with the audience or employees, incorporating illustration and visual elements can make a big difference. Many presenters often rely on wordy PowerPoint or keynote slides, which can be quite boring, aren't they? So um, naturally, they fail to connect with the audience. But if you take a more visual approach, like using illustrations or photos with concise sentences. You can ca capture the audience's attention, making the presentations a lot more entertaining and engaging. So let me share my experience about that. Um, about two years ago, I started making YouTube videos for teaching Japanese. I used to be a Japanese language teacher before I, came up, I became an artist. So um, I came up with the idea to make Japanese lesson videos using characters from my picture books. The characters in my videos are a friendly pair of socks called Bochi and Pochi, and I use them to teach Japanese. I actually have made many videos, um, I think just 10 video videos so far, my channel started getting popular and the number of channel subscribers is increasing very fast. I think I have tapped into a niche market where people seek both educational content and entertainment. Visuals are powerful tools to capture the audience's um, interest and make the content more enjoyable and engaging. Using characters also create a more intimate connection like Bochi and Pochi did. So uh, this approach can be applied to businesses looking to deliver messages in a more engaging and entertaining way, whether through presentations or by designing mascots for their companies. Are you familiar with mascots? Like yes. uh, company characters? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they are very popular in Japan. Japan is famous for manga and anime, so uh, no surprise there. Mascots are like uh, companies or organizations' ambassadors, and they help establish a personal connection with customers. In Japan, you see loads of mascots. They're everywhere, representing companies, organizations, and even prefectures. Do you know what prefectures are? 
No, explain. Okay, so prefectures are regional authorities like uh, states in the US. So uh, each prefecture has its own mascot and they use them to attract tourists and promote their local products. There's an especially popular mascot called Kumamon. Um, it's a black bear with a red round cheek and he represents Kumamoto Prefecture. And because he's so popular, Kumamoto Prefecture has been attracting so many tourists. I think they must have made so much money through him. So you can see mascots can help the business create a positive and personal connection with customers. But not only that, mascots can also help improve communication within the company by giving the business a character with a story and a clear vision. Employees can better understand the company's goals and aspirations. This helps the business minimize miscommunications and help employees walk down on the same path as the employer. So, so let's stay focused with this organization now. How would you coach them to get started in putting together this plan to put their words to life with, you know, within the company and externally to their customers? Mm -hmm. So uh, if I were to help your business, I would first make sure that I understand your message and the vision you want to communicate with your audience. Like I did with the uh, author for the CBB's project. Then I will create images that bring your words to life. Whether through illustrations or mascot, um, I will help you clarify your message so you can effectively deliver it to your audience or customer or company staff. And, and if they're not able to, because obviously you're in a completely different time zone, how would you recommend they start this process if they're not able to just engage with you? Well, although we have time difference, you are in America, I'm in the yes. UK, we are still connecting through Zoom and we have emails. So uh, get in touch with me anyway and we can arrange the time. So uh, that's no problem there. Okay. And so if they do want to reach out to you, Noriko, how can they mm -hmm. uh, get in touch with you? Um, so um, you can reach me through my website at www.norikoart.com. Noriko, uh, N-O-R-I-K-O, art.com. All my contact information and uh, emails and social media links, including YouTube. Um, permission info can be found there. Well, I can recommend everybody to go to the website because it is very entertaining to uh, to look through and uh, look at everything that you've created. Well done. So oh, thank you. <laughs> be be before we leave, Noriko, give us some final words of encouragement to help get us on the track to put our words to life? I'd say embrace creativity. That opens the door for better communication. So adding visuals to your message can bring clarity, playfulness, and empathy. So if you're an author, publisher, business owner, or manager, I encourage you to team up with individuals who can bring those visuals to your message. This way, uh, you find it easier to connect with your audience, staff or coworkers or customers, and you can establish shared vision with them. I believe this collaborative approach will pave the way um, for a brighter and more impactful, impactful future for all of us. No, and uh, I can't uh, agree more. And the key thing in here 
is the fact that most companies do not hire people for their creativity, especially when it comes to drawings and illustrations. Mm -hmm. and, and instead of wasting a lot of time of your employee's time to create something that might end up being exactly the piece of art that I created when I was seven year old, went to summer <laughs> camp, you know, get, get the right help, you know, reach out and, you know, to someone like you or, you know, find a, an illustrator that can take the time, ask the right questions, get the right message, you know, of the mission of that business, and then put together the right artistry, the right illustrations, the right characters to help move that along. Correct? Yeah. Um, it's a key uh, for both parties to understand um, the vision. So, um, yes, I would say make sure uh, art, both artists and uh, the company or author or um, manager, they understand, they, they establish the shared vision. So they can start from there. And uh, with visuals, that emotional connection they can uh, build is a really positive result we can see. So, uh, yes, um, let's collaborate. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Noriko, once again, thank you for being my guest today. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really um, appreciate um, being able to share my message with uh, everyone. So thank you for this opportunity. You're very welcome. My podcast wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for my sponsors and my uh, great supporters. So let me take this opportunity to thank each and every one of them. First of all, I wanna thank Rebecca at Custom Bookkeeping and Accounting, delivering trustworthy bookkeeping services since 2003. Dave and Dara at Virtues Matter, making this world a much happier place to be with their Virtues card apps, coaching and workshops. Steven at Buller Accounting, giving business owners depth and insight to their numbers. Eric and his team at Ivy Cat Web Design, the real superheroes of web development and design. Jennifer and Jean at the Seavers Real Estate Team, serving Pierce and Kitsap counties with their home buying and selling needs. Maury at the Maury Method, the world's only brainwave and trainment engineer, helping everyone have more clarity, less stress, and overall better brain health. Priya at Pivot My Profit, helping individuals and businesses have better control of their finances and more money at the end of their day. Melissa, at the Soul Vibe Energy High, the queen of the aha moments, helping individuals find those holes in their cups, repair the hole, and gain back their positive energy. And finally, Rick at West Sound Recording. You talk, they do all the rest. Thank you, Rick, for all your efforts with the production and editing of my podcast.